Okay, welcome back. We're going to continue on with prototypes. I thought uh, before we get into today's material, though, we'll uh, take a look at some recent progress. Uh, I had a great suggestion last night, and we've updated the player support and the tool support page for X3D, and we've stuck in uh, file encodings, what file encodings are supported. So that equals, uh, uh, of course, the .x3d XML file encoding that we're using in this class, the classic verbal .x3db, all those squiggly square brackets, and finally the uh, compressed binary encoding. We do have a second implementation on the way from uh, uh, instant reality. Of course, uh, XJ3d has been the primary implementer on that. All right, and uh, if you haven't been to this page before, it's uh, definitely helpful. We list, uh, beyond file encodings, we list what are the uh, component support browser by browser for each feature of X3D. And these roughly correspond to the chapters in the book. Uh, some chapters cover two or even three components, but uh, um, there's a lot here. There are a lot of components and a lot of capabilities. We've also updated the corresponding page uh, for tool support uh, in addition to the player support page. So let's jump to that. And here we go. Again, we see the file encodings support. And this is for both uh, authoring tools and conversion tools to convert to different file formats. And again, we go down the whole box score. And yeah, there's a lot of red nose and a lot of black partials, perhaps at a level, but uh, it's clear that industry support and, and even uh, research support groups doing updates to X3D and capabilities is uh, steadily maturing. I always like checking the uh, number of hits count at the bottom of the page. So, okay, we're almost above 8,000 hits. Not bad for uh, five, six weeks of unannounced activity. I guess we're ready to announce these pages now. Okay, the other uh, new thing we've added, I won't do a detailed uh, setup of it, but we have gotten um, schematron rules going. And let's see, where did I put my page for that? Let's just go to the resources page, X3D resources, and then uh, under authoring support, we've got a page for X3D Schematron, and here's the link for that, X3D Schematron, as you can see, it's, a, it's an additional form of XML validation. It's in addition to the DTD and Schema validation that we have. And it's great for detecting problems uh, and doing improved quality assurance uh, in our scenes that uh, DTDs and, and uh, schemas themselves, regular XML schemas, can't quite get. So if you want to see how to use this, there's plenty of pros here that describes what the heck it's all about. But we have a nice little link in here for X3D Edit, and uh, and it, has a screen snapshot that uh, shows how this works. And uh, here's the image. You can see uh, that if you pick a scene and uh, select it on the X3D menu, quality assurance, validate using all tests. I have in this scene here, I inserted a, a world info node in the uh, hello world scene and del deliberately put in an, er an error, an erroneous node, a world info, a metadata node, it's not allowed to have any children uh, such as a group in it. So if we select the menu here for validate all XML, then sure enough we get uh, that it passes the XML well form check. Yeah, that's okay, but if we go to a DTD or a schema, 
uh, it finds the error. Uh, and similarly, if we go to Schematron, it finds the error. So this is a, a great uh, resource for authors to improve the quality of their scenes. And uh, if you want to rerun the test, it gets you a handy dandy button right there up in the corner so that you can uh, keep checking your scene as you go along as you fix problems. Okay. All right, so there are updates for today. Now let's continue on with prototypes. And uh, we've gotten through the uh, introductory sections, our motivation, why we want to use prototypes, what are they all about, summary of the functionality. So we're ready to drill down now into the uh, syntax and the semantics of uh, Proto-Declare and the pieces inside it, Proto-Interface, Proto-Body, field definitions uh, within that. And uh, looking ahead, we'll, then, we'll later see how we can connect those interfaces uh, via isConnect so that a proto-interface is directly uh, uh, wrapped into, wrapped around the content that it captures. Okay, so proto-declare. So here's the uh, syntax. Please remember uh, the caveat from the first session that uh, we are using all XML-based syntax here. That's how we're stretching it out. The terminar terminology, the jargon, is just a little bit different in the original classic Vermal. When we went to uh, uh, XML, we had to be a little more explicit about things. So we, when the you know, slogan here that probably pertains, when the, when the going gets tough, the tough get verbose. So we, we chose names that were uh, completely uh, evident. And uh, here you see them. So proto-declare, uh, as we XMLize these things, we uh, give that declaration a pro name proto-declare, and it must have a name parameter, because there's no sense creating a cookie cutter if you don't have a handle to it. Similarly, no sense creating a, a template here, or a prototype, unless you have a name so that it can be used. Okay, so name is required. And then uh, uh, the proto interface scene is optional where we define our, our interfaces. But if you do have interfaces, then the field is required. You must have at least one field. Otherwise, what's the point of saying there's an interface? Okay. And so this is where we create what inputs and outputs and state variables can be a part of this prototype. Just like any other X3D node has inputs and outputs and state variables in the fields defined for it. Okay, once we've created this uh, node signature here, then we're ready to build the prototype itself. And so we have a special set of tags to wrap that, proto body, and this is required. And uh, if you don't have a proto body, then you don't have a proto, and again, what's the point? And this, why, this is why it's required when you put this thing together. So very important then is you must have an actual node in the body, and that first node, as the comments indicate here, is particularly important because it defines the node type of this prototype. So the X3D scene graph knows what to do with it. When the browser reads it and says, okay, I'm going to create a cookie cutter here, where am I allowed to put this new node? Well, it says if it's a grouping node, or if it's an interpolator, or if it's something like that, I know where to put it. Similarly, if it's a like material, or appearance, or shape, I know where to put it, okay? So this uh, first node is critical. And uh, critical, and it determines node type. 
since all typing in X3D is strict, no typing must match. This is therefore very important. Okay, and then you are allowed to have other nodes after that. They don't draw, they're not visible, they don't render, but they can be routed internally if you want to set up some kind of uh, fancy schmancy behaviors, animations, reactivity within that node. Uh, this is where you do it. Okay, if we then check our uh, XMLness of these constructs, I, could see, I think you could see that we have matching elements here, open and close proto declare, matching elements here for proto interface, similarly matching open and close proto body, and everything else in here looks good too. So you really do have a, a valid chunk of XML. Furthermore, right here inside the proto body, that is going to be a valid X3D scene subgraph. Okay, and so that's where we uh, well that's kind of a joke right there. Let's try it this way. That's where we uh, say, okay, that scene subgraph has to be uh, valid in its own right. So that if you took that out and put it elsewhere in the X3D scene, outside of the proto body, it would still work. Okay? So if we say that's our known X3D, all the stuff we're familiar with right there, what's in yellow, then What's in blue, these are the unique aspects of our proto declaration that we wrap around it. So, hopefully, this looks to be a pretty logical structure. We first have our interfaces, what node signature does this new node have, and then we have the internals, what adaptation of existing X3D is provided by this new proto declaration. Okay, so let's drill down uh, another step. Naming. Naming is, um, uh, of course, required for the prototype. You've got to uh, be able to say what it is if you're going to use it again. That sounds trivial. That sounds like, well, what a simple thing. Sure, just give it a name, whatever you want. But in, over the course of time, we found that naming is actually quite important and, that, and because of that we've come up with a, uh, a lot of conventions for that to help make the names clear. And of course uh, clarity is something to strive for anytime you're writing, whether you're writing a, a paragraph or a paper or a, a short note. But clarity is also important in your X3D scene graphs because the names you give things tend to influence how you think about them how you use them, how you put them together in a sentence, or how you put them together in a thought of what am I doing now? So it's absolutely a, a, an important practice to give things good names that make sense, that are consistent with uh, X3D, so that you find yourself building on the design patterns, the best practices that you're already used to. Okay, now we do have uh, a link in here to the scene authoring hints for uh, X3D and you can also find them in uh, the notes for this page. So let's, let's do that. In fact, uh, let's tweak the editing on this just a little bit. Nope, that didn't work. Let's highlight it, now edit it. To be precise, precise naming, it's not just scene offering hints, they're the X3D scene offering hints. And so that's uh, maybe a little hard to read right there, but that's okay. If we go to the notes for this page, then uh, we will find 
there's the link spelled out right there, and we can click on it either way and get there. So here are the naming conventions of the scene authoring hints. I'll go to the top of the page so it's recognizable. There we are. And uh, naming conventions is right here. Okay, so here are the naming conventions. And let's spend a moment. Let's look at these and let's go back to the slides and say uh, which ones were captured. First, uh, camel case naming. And where did we come up with that one? Well, that's a, a computer science uh, term. Camel case naming is where if you have a multiple word uh, phrase that you want to be part of a single name, then what you do is you smash all the words together, get rid of any intermediate white space, and we capitalize the first word in each term. And so uh, I guess you could call this a three hump camel right here on this first word, uh, camel case naming. Um, another good thing about this when you do it is don't use abbreviations. No really, please, because uh, people do not abbreviate consistently. Further, abbreviations can uh, sometimes collide with each other. You may think an abbreviation stands for one thing, it actually stands for another. Bad naming. Okay. And then uh, it's also, I think, an internationalization consideration. It's hard enough figuring out English when you're not a native English speaker. When, when people start throwing around arbitrary, obscure abbreviations, it gets even harder. So if you want your stuff to be clear, if clarity is, is the key, then this is a good way to do it. Okay, what's another rule here? Start with a lowercase letter when you're naming fields. Start with an uppercase letter when you're naming nodes, either for node names or for defs. Okay? Uh, you do want to be consistent. Uh, so sometimes paraphrases, creativity is punished. The consistency helps, it makes it more predictable, and uh, you have to be an exact match as well. For example, in, in some things, uh, in a URL, you'll find that uh, if you mismatch the name capitalization of a file in a URL, that uh, one operating system, the Windows operating system, is very forgiving about that. It will let you find the file as long as the letter's back. However, as soon as you put that up on an HTTP server and try to retrieve it, it will fail. Okay, so I, I would say it might be well-intentioned, but actually the lack of strict naming there hurts you because you can have a set of scenes that work together very nicely, thank you, on the local system but don't work on the remote system. Okay, uh, other gotchas in here are uh, things like underscores and hyphens can get you into trouble. It's best to avoid them. Um, um, keeping your file name extensions, uh, lowercase, uh, and there are plenty of examples here that illustrate this. So we won't drag in drag through every single one. However, I will point out that we did have a great uh, metric that uh, Jeff Weekly uh, came up with about when is a name successful? How do you know the name is right? And so this one's pretty funny. When uh, nobody talks about it anywhere, when nobody asks, because uh, a name describes what you're thinking about. So you can use it in the sentence you can use it in a comment, you can use it in an email, and people go, okay, yeah, right, got it, makes sense. The counterpoint to that one is when people keep asking, well, well wait a minute, what about, what about that thing there? You're telling me this about that, but what is, that's often an indicator that the name is perhaps a mismatch, a slight misnomer that's not describing something properly. So, uh, we do end up, at least around our group here, spending a lot of time 
looking and re-looking at names to get them just right. Reason, it pays off. It makes things work better. Okay, so there's the uh, long form on naming. Let's see what the uh, pages also say about that. If we got these. Uh, okay, so got this, got that. Uh, oh, here's an important rule. You can only use a name once. If you have a proto declare that says my new node and an external proto declare that says my new node, well, which one's right? Which one's my new node? Answer let's not confuse the poor computer with that. Instead, let's not do it because it would not be clear. It would be ambiguous and error prone. So let's avoid it since we don't want errors. Okay, what else? Uh, another good test of your names is to use it in the sentence. So here's one. Uh, here's a, a node that we're going to look at. A material modulator. We wanted to create a new node and, and what it does is change material values. So, so let's try it out in a sentence. A material modulator node is similar to, it mimics a material node and it modulates field values as an animation effect. Okay, I guess so. If, if it says so, then it seems to make sense. It's consistent. But uh, if it were inconsistent or awkward, that would immediately stand out. Or if somebody who, who's knowledgeable about the topic, you go, you read it or look at it, you go, what, what are you telling me again? What, what exactly does that mean? That's usually a, a flag that there's ambiguity there. Now something else we have in uh, uh, X3D that's helpful is we've taken a page from the uh, schema, XML schema uh, definitions and we've provided a field called app info. And app info lets us embed built-in comments, metadata really, about the prototype that can be a tooltip. App info here is an abbreviation, which I didn't make up, <laughs> but it is the uh, accepted abbreviation for application info. And uh, so that's another helpful thing in here to help describe your name. So much as uh, a, a one-page report ought to be able to have a topic paragraph, or uh, a paragraph ought to have a topic sentence, similarly, the name of your prototype should not only make sense, but you ought to be able to write a one sentence description of what does this node do. That's a good thing to put into your app info. Okay? What else? Well, we've, we've covered this. The best names are when no one has to ask anymore. Okay, uh, here are the naming uh, convention summarized or excerpted at least from the uh, scene authoring hints and it's tempting to say well thank you very much Don for all those nice little handy dandy rules but uh, gee those are your personal biases and preferences and I code a different way I write things a different way and I'm used to the way I name and write and code things if, if I were to be asked that I, Say, well, I'm a little sure, you know. Okay, but please be advised. We did not just come up with these rules by me sitting uh, in a dark room late at night saying, ah, oh, let's tell everybody what to do. Rather, each of these rules, just like all of the scene authoring hints, evolved over time. And in fact, a lot of them evolved right in this class here in previous iterations of it is. We build models as we try to put them together, as we try to get them to work as ensembles, as collections, as we try to share them and make sense of them. Sometimes you hit the wall, you hit a hard spot, you hit a, a friction or a conflict point. Each one of these rules evolved from that. We found that most of them are avoiding bad practices that get you into trouble. So your mileage may vary. 
You can do things your way, that's certainly fine. Most of these conventions are just that. We think they're good practices. They've helped us enough that we've written them down. If you have other conventions you think are useful, great, please send them in. And uh, if enough people agree, we'll, we'll add them to the scene authoring hints. Um, uh, they're absolutely uh, editorial and they're, they're a little bit biased, but they are biased by our practice and our lessons learned here, not by any arbitrary ideology about how to do it. Okay? So, uh, I think the only other thing to say there, I hope this carry, this, this does come through in the, in the detailed descriptions and elsewhere. We usually always try to put a reason why we have a naming convention and an example of how it works and occasionally even a counterexample of why it would be broken if you didn't follow that. So we do try to be results driven on these guys. Okay, given that we know how to name things now, we can strive for clarity in names that make sense, what do we do next? Well, okay, we've got our proto-declaration, and we've, we've named that darn thing. Proto-interface is this next section, again, where we're defining the node's signature, the fields that it has, just like any other X3D scene. Okay, so uh, how do we do that? Well, the proto interface is sort of a, a blocks out that section. Then we go field by field, and cleverly named the field tag is where we define each one of those. Okay, and it's possible that you don't have a field to define, that uh, your node has no interfaces, that it just does what it does and doesn't need any configuration, has no outputs, has no inputs. Okay, in which case you can skip that. Now, good news, the field definition that we're using in here is exactly the same as the field definition that we use in the script node. Okay, so that means it should be pretty familiar if you went through uh, chapter 9 and looked at that. So just like the prototype itself, we need to give a name to each field. If there's no name, what, what good is it? What data type is it? Usually those are simple types like uh, SF vector EF, SF color, uh, SF bool, etc. Could be a more complex type. It could be an SF node or even an MF node. So you have the same range of types available to any other x 3 node. We have the access type, whether it's an input only, an output only, an input output, or an uh, initialize only, meaning uh, you can give an initial value but then can't change it externally after that. Okay, so we get choices of that and as appropriate, depending on the type, we would have an initial value. Uh, if you go, what do you mean as appropriate? Well, uh, let's say, let's take a string example. If you give a value a string, the null string, the empty zero character string, is a legal string itself. So you don't have to give it a default initialization on there. Similarly, uh, uh, if you have arrays, floating point numbers, uh, null array is an allowed value. There are times when it's not appropriate. If a field is an input only, if a field is an output only, those can't get initialized. They're transient. They only consume or produce events. So they would not be initialized. So those rules, once again, are the same as when we use field for script nodes. OK, and here, in fact, are those rules for uh, initialize and input only that help describe that, whether it's appropriate or not. Get initialize and input. a typo there, sorry about that, let's fix this guy right now. You guys see the mistake? We've listed input only twice and haven't mentioned uh, input output, so that goes right here. Okay, 
input output fields can be initialized. Input only, output only are transient. They only send and consume events, so they cannot have an initial value. Okay, now as a helpful reference, we have included here the table of, from the book of all the different types. Of course, you can also look up these types in the uh, X3D specification. But this table uh, is reproduced from uh, uh, chapter 14 on prototypes. It's on uh, page 388. And uh, this is helpful when you're defining fields for scripts, helpful when you're defining scripts for fields for uh, prototypes. And uh, note that it does give you default values here uh, uh, if you're wondering what the uh, unprovided defaults would be. And this is a, an interesting area. Uh, some browsers are very forgiving if you don't give a default value when it's required, but it's not a good idea. It's best to initialize it yourself because others might be stricter and fail. Another interesting thing here is uh, you still see people uh, sometimes mixing this up. If you're working in the XML syntax, you use false lowercase to match all the other XML languages. If you're in the classic verbal context, uh, syntax, you use uh, capital letter false. Similarly, that would be true. Lowercase or true, uppercase, depending on XML or classic verb. Okay. Here are the rest of the data types. All look pretty straightforward. It's a long list, a lot of stuff, but that's because there's a lot of different data that's possible in X3D. And so since we're strict about it, we don't want to stick square pegs in around holes. We always want the data coming in to match where it's going. This is why we are so uh, deliberate about each of these time values, each of these uh, field values. Okay, so now that we've defined the interface of our prototype, it's uh, time to do the body, and uh, this should look pretty familiar by this point. The first node matters. That's what defines it. Uh, additional nodes can get stuck in there, though they won't be rendered. And uh, usually, just to make sure you remember that, X3D Edit will give you a warning. Although, uh, if you stick in a comment after the first node and before the subsequent nodes, we use that as an indicator. Okay, you know what you're doing. That comment probably uh, says something like, the rest of the nodes won't render. So let's take a simple example then. Here's a node that does not have uh, any interfaces to it, no field definitions, and it's just saying, well, here's a particular material value that we use so many times we'd like to define it. So it's an interesting uh, case in point. It's captured from the Universal Materials Library and uh, even built in, but now we're going to see just where that comes from. Uh, so let's take this definition right here and go into X3D Edit and just pull it up quickly and take a look at this guy. So uh, here's the prototype excerpt and you can see that uh, Okay, we have a number of prototypes in here, Art Deco, 0, 1, 2, etc. So let's open one of these. So I'm going to right click on Proto Declare and edit it. And you can see we get a nice uh, multi purpose um, uh, interface here that not only includes the name, but will let us add fields if we want and then also lets us uh, put in uh, application info, a single tooltip, or documentation. Okay, so the proto interface field, excuse me, the proto declare interface 
does let us uh, uh, work on more than one thing at a time. Okay, where did that come from? Now let's look at the proto body interface and see what that does. Edit. Uh, it just jumps up one. I don't think we have a special proto body interface because all proto body can do is contain stuff. So uh, if we go inside the proto body now and edit that, uh, I know this thing's toying with me now. We just get our basic node editor. All right, so inside the proto body, it's a fragment of X3D, and it can be used just like anything else. Uh, we can edit it like any other node in the scene graph. Okay, so there's you go. There you go. There's our first prototype declaration, and now that we've defined these nodes. We can use these new nodes as proto instances anywhere in our same scene, anywhere in that same file. And if we put that file on the web or in a local directory structure, we can also make it accessible to other scenes that want to reach in, pull out that template by an external proto declare definition, and then create an instance in their own file. Okay? I could see uh, one place where we might improve this scene, and let's do that, and then we'll call it a day for this lesson. Notice that we do have these three materials here available: our deco one, two, excuse me, zero, one, and two. But then we don't bother to use them; we just use a plain old material right there. So why don't we delete that material and instead stick in a prototype instance? Okay, so here we go, drag and drop, proto instance right inside the appearance node. And uh, we should get a little panel here. I'm not sure my computer heard me. We should get a little panel here, hello, hello. I've done something wrong, or it's just waking up here. No, it says it's loading the grammar, so I think I have some, please wait, I have some extra things going on in my system here. When it comes up, I can already tell you what it's going to look like, and that's on the next slide. And there was our declare. There's our proto instance right here. highlighted. So what I'll do now is uh, hopefully X3D is uh, woken up for us. And I'll copy that text just in case my interface doesn't wake back up. We can just drop that right in to the scene. and take advantage of that availability of that prototype node. Okay, it's still waking up, so here I am. We've just typed and pasted it in. And um, I think they should, that should work right there. If we edit it. Okay, something's going on here. So, we'll pull that up for next time. Let's uh, clear victory for this session. And so, where are we? What we've done is we've gotten through the syntax for proto-declare, proto-interface, proto-body, and field declarations. And so, what we're experimenting with now is how do we get these guys to work. And so on our next session, when we pick up, we will look at uh, examples. We'll uh, 
make sure our examples work. And then we'll continue on with isConnect and how those interfaces can be cross-connected into the protobody so that you have a working, coherent, connectable construct that events can come out of and events can go into. Okay, so we'll see you next time. Oh, we were doing so well until X3D edit bogged down at the end there. Now we're trying to escape and probably find a way to